Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think thank you for, for having me here and for giving us the opportunity to present this report that we've created with uh, Temasek and Google. Few key messages, and really I'll focus as much on the, you know, what the findings are, but also a little bit on what's the implication for us, uh, in particular from a marketing and digital marketing uh, standpoint. I think the first, and I hope you can all hear me clearly, the first big point here is that there is a fundamental shift in both the income demographic and in consumption patterns. It's already happened and it's expected to further accelerate. So if you look at what we're calling lower middle and upper middle, and sorry, what, what we're calling upper middle and high income households, there are about 117 million today in 2022. By 2030, that number is going to become around 195 million. So we're going to be adding in the next eight years almost the entire number of households that exist in that income strata today. That's an additional 80 million households in that income strata, all of them extremely connected, extremely uh, high in terms of disposable income, willingness to spend, and so on. So that's really fundamentally the, and, and of course, this is something which will impact not just digital, but will impact digital perhaps more than it does uh, other channels. We have a very large quantity of consumers on the internet today, but what's more interesting actually is the quality of what they're doing, uh, doing online. So if I look at time spent online, six and a half hours, I mean, it, it's, it sounds funny, but it's six and a half hours per day per user on the internet. And this is higher than evolved economies like China. 700 million internet users. Number two, they're spending a lot of time on social media. There's 470 million folks on social media spending the highest, even if you compare it to developed markets like the US. So that's really high quality engagement over there. Video, off the charts, 1.6 hours a day, and of course, digital payments, which we all know about, where India has absolutely leapfrogged all other economies. Uh, we have 350 million digital payment users. That's one fourth of the population. Um, and that's the number of transactions per cap, 65 transactions per person per year. So it's not just about the quantity of people online. I think that's existed for a while now, but it's about the quality of the time that they're spending and the multiple types of things they're doing from you know, discovery to engaging with others, to engaging with content, to actually making transactions and purchases. And you know, we're at a tipping point, right? So 220 million shopped online, 110 million made purchases in games, 65 million people ordered food online. I mean, who was ordering food online as little as five or six years ago? And you know, it's just getting started because if you look at the internet economy, which today is about $170 billion, it's about half of the technology sector. It was only, uh, it was only 15% uh, 10 years ago. That's expected to become about 60% and to become a trillion dollar economy. And it's happening across. E-commerce, of course, that's the one that gets spoken about the most B2C e-commerce. That's going to grow five or six times over the next eight years. B2B e-commerce is another big one, which and different companies are slowly starting to make strides. In fact, even in setting up their own B2B systems, that's how big this channel is going to become. Of course, there's SaaS, travel, online media, which is very, very big, food delivery, ed tech, and so on. So across sectors, and what you know, we're seeing happen with a lot of our clients is that this creates an ecosystem opportunity. You know, 80% of consumers now actually begin with search in terms of if they're looking for something, top of the funnel happens online, middle of the funnel, which really is discovery and search, happens online, and the material amount of transactions also happen online. So it's an ecosystem effect, really, that's kicking in uh, at an enormous order of magnitude. And I'm just going to cover, I think, what are the most important messages for this group. And of course, we know, I think, a lot has happened from a back-end infrastructure perspective, be it, uh, you know, Aadhaar, the fact that today all our documents are available online, it's paperless, 
UPI and we saw the payment statistic earlier in terms of how much India has leapfrogged on payments per capita. And more and more, I think privacy uh, and you know, how data is shared is also becoming an important enabler to provide more trust, security as consumers continue to spend more time, uh, both in terms of spend more time and spend more time doing more things across platforms. And you know, I think the interesting thing here is it's not just about Mumbai and Delhi uh, and Hyderabad and, and Calcutta and so on. And in fact, it's not just about the top 60 cities. It's about as much and will become more and more so about tier two India. And as how we think about how, you know, where our, how we reach our consumers, this means that the internet today is well poised for most brands to actually be even the sole source of the entire funnel in terms of how we're reaching them from a above the line perspective, how we're able to convert them or, you know, into interest based groups, how we're finally able to convert that into business. All of that can happen on the internet now because T2 is really going to be very, very material. It's already material today. I don't think we realize that enough because we still tend to think of, you know, if you look at digital marketing plans on most brands, they tend to say, okay, we'll do top up reach or we'll do stuff on Instagram for top five, top 10 million consumers. But when you start thinking about T2, that's a very material opportunity, but equally it's a very big shift in mindset in terms of how we think about digital as a medium, uh, both from a reach as well as a uh, commerce perspective. And T2 consumers are just, you know, they're not to be left behind when we, you know, we, we compare them to T1 consumers. They spend more time online and they spend a lot of time on digital services. In fact, in some cases, more time on digital services. So if you look at food delivery, they're spending a little bit more time. If you look at education, they're spending 60% more time. Net net, this is a, a sophisticated and evolved digital consumer. The T2 consumer is not different from T1. In fact, is demonstrating even more levels of engagement across the various gamut of activities compared to T1 consumers. T2 consumers also trust local relatable influencers more than celebrities. And this, I, I know the entire influencer marketing piece is often, it's something people have become cognizant of in the last, you know, I'd say seven, eight years. But something that's really gaining more and more traction today. And there's a big shift, as we all know, that's happening from, you know, first it was celebrity to macro influencer, now it's macro influencer to micro influencer, micro to nano. from. English language content to vernacular. We know vernacular works better uh, in, in T2 markets, and so do vernacular influencers. So really there's a very, very big shift from, uh, and if you look at the data points before and, and take this one as well, there's a very big shift in terms of how we think about how our brands reach our consumers, where do we reach them, what kind of messages do we reach them with, who are the ambassadors or the celebrities or the influencers of that message. I think it requires a very big mindset shift uh, versus what uh, was happening, let's say, what's happening today and definitely what was happening three, four years ago. And this really also then opens up the need to have enabling technologies around, you know, first party data is a big one, but you're actually able to segment consumers because while T2 consumers and T1 consumers are similar in their propensity to spend, what interest them, which influencers appeal the most to them, what products they're likely to buy, what pack sizes they're likely to buy, what their journey is likely to be, which language they want to consume content in. All of these things are quite different. So more and more it's becoming important not to just go, you know, one to many in a, in a broad-based manner, but to go many to many and to do it online and to do it in, in a segmented manner. They're also you know, more open to experimenting with new brands. I mean, who would have thought of this? Because you would assume that, and you know, as uh, having run multiple brands earlier myself, we always looked at T1 as the big, or, or the, the top cities as the biggest source of threat in terms of insurgent brands coming in. Yes, that's typically where they start because it's where they're able to reach the fastest or at least where they spend disproportionate amount of their investments 
but more and more that threat is going to go across markets because T2 consumers are as open or more open, in fact, if you, if you look at this data, to trying out new brands and products. So no longer is it that, you know, we think of core brands servicing a bulk of the country through traditional marketing models and new brands coming in just at the top amongst the select premium set. It's a when, not if question that technology will open up this battlefield to make it a far more level playing field without the traditional sources of comparative advantage existing for the large brands. And they also have an underlying preference for made in India and they also want personalization. Now personalization of course has always been, you know, it's been a buzzword for a while, but more and more if you just look at the data in terms of what people are responding to, the fact that different advertising for different cohorts gives you far more engagement, um, the fact that different people buy different pack size. So personalization in it is the journey has begun. But as you think about personalization, not just for, you know, T1 separate and the rest of India separate, but you actually start looking at T1 and T2 and breaking that up. There is a lot to be done. And personalization does not mean we, you know, customize the product formulation for every individual. That's the most extreme form of it. What it really means is having the most relevant offering, both from a proposition perspective, medium of reach perspective, and finally, you know, product perspective, having a relevant version of that is very, very important. And here, large organizations, they have started doing a lot of audience segmentation, um, seeing the benefits, first party data, again, I think I'd say basic level of use across most organizations, but really getting to very good in terms of actually being able to run that engine where you're able to look at, you know, break up audiences into smaller cohorts, target them with customized messaging, measure the differential impact of having done that and then close the feedback loop. I think that's an area of big shift that's required as we think about how to win not just with T1 but T1 and T2 uh, online. And, you know, I think the, so maybe I'll spend a bit of time on this. Large organizations are responding uh, and there's typically three, four big models that exist. I think the first is, yes, at the, at the bare minimum there is a disproportionate focus and an independent setup for e-commerce uh, and in some cases even for digital brands. Two, incubation of new brands in-house. Organizations are realizing that you can't just win with core brands anymore. You need to have a portfolio and a portfolio that has multiple smaller brands versus just two or three very large brands. So organizations are setting up different, you know, incubation cells. The third is the entire piece around investment and partnerships, which many examples of which you see over here, where organizations are making large investments. You know, they each, you know, for example, most companies have their own venture fund equivalent. They make minority investments. Some of them are doing outright acquisitions. But there is a buying of brands and buying of capabilities and then insourcing them into the mother organization. That is the third route that's being taken. And fourth, of course, there's the ecosystem route, you know, and you can define ecosystem as content and commerce, so you can define it as, uh, you know, ex having one app with multiple uh, different options from, you know, engagement to, to purchase. But there's different types, this D2C is another big one, but the, really the fourth is around building ecosystem. So these are kind of the four big things that, that large, more traditional organizations are starting to do. And if you look at the names on this chart, uh, these are, you know, deeply entrenched incumbent traditional organizations. They've been around for a very, very long time. But just look at how aggressive they're getting in terms of doing one of the one or multiple of the four things that I've just mentioned. So, so what does all this really uh, sort of mean for us? I think, and there's seven imperatives that we need, and this is where I'm going to spend the most time. Seven imperatives. Uh, for us as I would call more traditional businesses or more traditional brand or marketing organizations. The first, you know, mind share and market share are becoming more and more similar. Historically, distribution advantages were a big driver of differential market share. So you could have a brand that had lower mind share, but because it was more available, would have higher market share than mind share. So, you know, share of market greater than brand power. That is changing. It's changing first at the top, but if you look at all the statistics around T2, it's a when not if question that it will change across. And therefore, building mind share is very, very, is a single, it is always very important for brands, but its relative importance will continue to grow. 
And the big shift over there will be it's not just about core brands, it's not just about a few consumer cohorts, it's about multiple brands playing the portfolio and being able to personalize leveraging first party data. So that's really the first big shift and the first imperative to help businesses today thrive tomorrow. The second is convenience. Now, uh, we've seen this across some of the chart, but more broadly speaking, UI, UX is becoming very, very important. So if you have a D2C website, and just giving a simple example here, how fast that page loads and how, how many clicks you have from selecting the product to being able to buy it, what is the order of the various images or the content that I put on the page uh, when I'm trying to convert a, 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 a shopper, all of these things make a huge difference because ultimately you have a very limited window to be able to reach, impact, and finally monetize the interest of consumers. So that's a different mindset where organizations now, in fact, there is going to more and more be, even in traditional organizations, a tech way of thinking about the consumer experience. Third, uh, we've spoken about personalization. The important thing on personalization, again, I'll reinforce that it's not about different products for everyone, but it's really about saying, if I segment the market well into the most meaningful cohorts that are different from each other, am I able to at scale, because it's not about one million people or five million people, it's about how can I do this with 50 million people? Can I at scale tailor my messaging and tailor my consumer journey to each of these cohorts? Because you've seen it, it's not just about T1, even T2 cities and, and towns as we've seen there, they are willing to pay for personalization and we've seen the data time and time over again that when you do have a customized creative with a vernacular, with a, with a micro in, or nano influencer in the vernacular, it gives you much higher click-through rate, much higher engagement rate. So we just need to find as a, you know, as as FMCG marketing organizations, really a way to be able to do this at scale. There's all, everyone's got successful pilots running over here, but if you look at how many are doing it at scale, uh, when they're reaching 10, 15, 20, 50 million consumers, I think there's a pretty big drop off over there. And of course, I think the point around values over values, it is yes, you do need to bring your brand to the front in terms of what it's saying, what its values are, because the, le the, the playing field is much more equalized now. If you look at, most brands will be available online. They're competing on a level playing field. So all the more what your brand stands for. Uh, and by the way, even on the product front, I mean, in many cases, a lot of brands have products which test parity. We always assume our products are absolutely the best as a company, but typically parity scores are very common. So really, the brand needs to be front and center and communicate its values. And what a better medium than actually the, you know, any of these digital mediums where there's extremely high levels of engagement from both T1 and T2 consumers. And so that's really the first part which is around the consumer. But if I then look at, you know, at the back end, what do organizations need to do? I think first is they need to venture into brave new worlds. And this really is a very broad phase for a different approach to innovation. You know, who would have, thought that it is an acceptable model to launch 25 products and know that only one of them will succeed and actually plan for the failure and the removal of 24 products. That is very, you know, antithetical to how a large organization thinks about it, where every launch is expected to succeed, but actually almost none of them do. So how we do innovation, how we do pack price architecture on e-commerce, and so a whole set of things. Those are the brave new worlds that organizations now need to get into in terms of tapping into the power of digital, that's one. Two, the operating model, and we've, in a lot of our work with our clients, we've seen that it's the operating model that actually makes or breaks this, because eventually you get, with time, the right intent. So you know, typically digital strategy and portfolio gets done, but then when the work is actually happening, very traditional organization structures and traditional workflows actually come in the way of the speed required to run these digitally forward businesses. You know, so for example, performance marketing is a daily sport. It's not a weekly sport. It's, not a, it's no longer about 
you know, briefing your agency on the 15th of the, whatever, maybe the 10th of the month, uh, for those of us who get it in time, uh, for the next month, locking in the campaign by the 20th, and then just doing nothing for a full month with regard to advertising. You actually need to do this on a daily basis. And it's not just about performance marketing, that's the most evident one because it's immediately monetizable, but it's also true for content into commerce, it's true for, you know, what, uh, social media posts, you know, we, we, one of the brands which I used to run, we moved it to a place where we did nine posts a day uh, and we got 50 million organic free impressions a month. But that required a certain daily clock speed that typical structures don't have. And then of course there's the questions around, you know, where should performance marketing lie and so on. But there's a whole set of operating model questions and that's really what operating model 2.0 is, which is to say what's the right structure governance, division of responsibilities and ways of working that enables one to make a shift from a traditional organization to a more digitally forward organization. And of course, what's the career path for, for the right kind of talent? Because it's not the same. Yes, the fundamentals are the same and you do need a lot of the talent that has been very successful so far, but you do also need more and more you know, specialists uh, in a lot of these areas, you know, content, not advertising, performance marketing, not brand building, uh, so on and so forth. And the third bit which I alluded to, uh, and this is the seventh point, and I'll, I'll wrap up here, is really the new revenue stream. So what we call it, Bain as Engine 2, is really what a lot of these organizations are doing organically. So if you look at new brand incubation, in a lot of very large organizations, you know, if you look at Levers, if you look at Marico, lots of Engine 2, lots of new brands coming in organically but also inorganically. So the biggest, the first big piece is actually setting up these new business units that can incubate or acquire new brands that's on the brand side and equally there's new revenue streams that link in from a capability perspective. So that's really the, the summary of the key messages. I think it's to say that yes of course we know the world is changing and everyone's been saying that for a very very long time but actually if I look at the the last three to four years and the expected what's going to, and if I look at what's going to happen over the next four to five years, we really are at a tipping point when it comes to digital uh, and how we use this medium not just to survive uh, but for our brands to actually thrive. Thank you.